Uh, we have identified at least two new taxa during this one year's time. That analysis is an important thing and we have the instructions that we must complete the gap analysis of all the crops. And this year we have completed the georeferencing of 16 crops and have the georeferencing of them right now with us. Exchange was very, very important. We all know that due to COVID, it has been impacted severely across the world. But despite that, we could clear 125,000 samples of germplasm and international nurseries around the world. So these are two divisions, the exchange as well as the quarantine. We took special time ensuring that the seed reached our clients at an appropriate time. There's no delay in that. Um, that was what my colleagues at NBPGR did, work over time to ensure that seed reached them in time. We had a responsibility of uh, facilitating the export of germplasm as well. And this year, we have exported almost 13,000 samples. So that means the quarantine of that was very important before it reached the other side of the world. We did that one as well during this time. During this year, 2021, 2020, almost 26 thousand accessions were characterized in the field condition. Those are primarily for the descriptors, for dust characters, and evaluation of the important traits. As a result, several new genetic stocks have been identified, both for biot expresses, a biot expresses, as well as the nutritional traits. And a good number of them have already been identified with different markers to make them better usable. If we see this year's progress in germplasm, adding more germplasm to our gene bank, almost 7,000 new accessions were added to gene bank this year, making it a total of 452,000 accessions in the long-term storage of the country. So this is seed storage. Likewise, for cryo, 134 accessions were added. For in vitro, 31 new accessions were added, thus making our cryo gene bank to around 12,000 and in vitro gene bank around more than 1,900 accessions which are being conserved. To add to that, more than 3,000 DNA samples have been added to the genomics DNA bank in this, uh, this year as well. We have a responsibility of DNA fingerprinting for the varieties which are to be released by the national system. And this year, we have been able to fingerprint 125 new varieties of 25 agri-horticultural crops in the country. 23 consignments of the GMOs of papaya and soybean arrived in the nation, we did analyze those as well. We, had, we have been given the responsibility to really develop the protocols for identifying the presence of the GM in food products. And we have been successful in developing the protocol for about 23 different products, including oil, where we can now analyze the presence of the GM in those. Several of my colleagues, they have been found for different awards during this year. Dr. Grundarji Trindhava was awarded with Punjab of Deshmukh Outstanding Women Scientist Award. Dr. Rakesh Singh, Dr. S.C. Dubey, they have been conferred with different awards. So this year, we have been able to publish 97 publications in peer reviewer journals, four books, two books edited. Okay. 
25 popular articles, and so on. So we made a lot of progress during this year, but we were unfortunate as well to have lost a couple of our colleagues during this year because of the COVID. We express our sincere thanks to all of them for their contributions to NDP. This is in brief, the progress made during last one year. Now I will have the pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Our today's speaker is Dr. Paul Gaps. Dr. Paul is a distinguished professor at the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of California, Davis. Paul did his PhD from the University of Wisconsin in plant breeding and genetics in 1984. Paul has an interest in several areas, but the more important ones for us, which I will go, I will like share with you is his main trust is in teaching and outreach programs in the study of crop agrobiodiversity for the purpose of conservation and application of breeding programs. The primary area of focus is on the social of beans. Five of them, he is working on those. And he is a global leader when it comes to the beans, the genetic resources, the evolution, and the conservation of those. Paul is currently leading several global projects. The few ones which I will really mention are the California Dry Bean Advisory Board. Lima bean and garbanzo bean breeding. He is leading genomic recombination landscape of common bean in relation to drought and heat tolerance and other traits of agronomic importance. He is leading another trick house trust led project, African Bean Consortium. Their research activities at the UC Davis are in support of the ABC breeding program for multiple disease resistance. Is leading another program on evolution and changing environment. Genetic architecture of adaptation outside centers of domestication of physiological gas. He's a very, very like teacher by the people. And this I'm telling based on my experience with several students, but he's one of the best teachers in the university in the Department of Plant Sciences. And the important sources we teach is the evolution of crop plants and plant genetics. Paul has 237 peer reviewed publications, and he has participated in more than 300 international seminars and symposiums. He has so far guided 16 master students and 25 PhD students. Paul is on the board of several important leading journals of the world. And a few to quote is that he's associate editor of Frontiers in Plant Sciences. He's associate editor in Genetic Resources and Crop Evolution. And he's scientific coordinator of African Bean Consortium. Paul has been rewarded by several awards. And a few to mention at the Chancellor's Award for International Engagement at UC Davis in 2018. Agropolis Lewis Massachusetts Prize of Participating Scientist 2017. International Scientific Prize for Agriculture and Food 2017. Frank Mayer Medal for Transatlantic Resources by the Top Science Society of America in 2015. Galvin Sterling Biodiversity Memorial Lecture Award by the Crop Science Society of America in 2014. Levi Morrison Award of USDA ARS American Society of for Horticultural Sciences in 2013. Paul is a fellow of the Crop Science Society of America and American Society of the Ground. I know there's a limitation of the time. I cannot go beyond that one. So these 
week about the progress made by NDPR during the year 2021 and a brief introduction of all. I invite all for delivering the Dr. Harbhajan Singh Memorial Lecture. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank um, thank you very much, Kaldeep. It's um, a real pleasure. I thank you very much for this uh, very generous uh, introduction. And it's a real pleasure and a big honor for me to be uh, here uh, today uh, with you. Uh, I think the, the institution NBPGR is really well known uh, around the world uh, for its excellent work in germplasm conservation. And so for me, it is uh, an honor to be with you. Uh, frankly, I would have preferred to interact personally, but you know, given the circumstances, uh, the Zoom will do. <laughs> uh, but uh, certainly to visit uh, uh, some of your stations and so on would have been very much of interest uh, to me. Um, I should now actually share my screen, which I will do. Can you see my, um, in a minute. Can you see my screen here? The first slide, it should say challenges yes. to the utilization. Yes, the slides are visible. Please go ahead, uh, Paul. Oh, very good. So let me go then right into the uh, the talk here. Um, so if all the buttons would work, that would be great too. Just click again on the slide, please. And then you can use your arrow buttons or some buttons for moving ahead. Here. So I thought that, that I would just kind of highlight a few of the experiences I've had with genetic resources conservation and utilization. I really started, uh, I got off to a good start because I uh, became a research associate at a genetic resources unit of SEAT. Uh, which is one of the CG centers, just like you have uh, ICRISAT in India. And I worked on phaseolus germplasm. That's where I really uh, started, uh, both wild and domesticated and in interspecific crosses uh, between phaseolus species. From 1981 to 1984, I did a PhD uh, research at the University of Wisconsin, as Kaldip mentioned. Um, and I studied the variation for seed proteins. And out of that work uh, came the findings of a double domestication in common bean, Phaseolus vulgaris. And that was probably, according to Jack Harlan, the first time that somebody had unequivocally demonstrated the uh, double domestication on, on, on molecular level. Uh, after 1985, I moved to California, first at Riverside and now at uh, Davis. And uh, in 2012, um, I added the responsibility of the grain legume breeding program, mostly in phaseolus, but there is also a small amount of work on chickpea. Um, so uh, that has made me familiar with both gene banks as well as the use of the genetic resources conserved in uh, these gene banks. And it seems to me that the major challenge of any organization, but especially of gene banks, is how can we improve the use of the genetic resources collections in these uh, gene banks? Uh, it's often said that uh, the gene banks are not used very much, which for which I, I disagree. And I'll mention here at the left of the screen, uh, an example of uh, one of your compatriots, Harry Upadhyaya uh, of ICRISAT, where he calculated 
the number of accessions, for example, of groundnut, both domesticated and wild, uh, 142, uh, led to the development of more than 8,000 breeding lines. So you might say, well, 142 is not very much, but I would argue that that is precisely the value of a gene bank uh, is to provide that genetic diversity and through the uh, so selection work of breeders, you develop a value added project. And so I'm not that concerned with the actual numbers, uh, but rather the availability and making these genes available uh, to the breeding community and thereafter uh, to the, the public. Uh, the same thing is for that study on the right here, a Chinese study, and you look at here, the, the, the right here, the percentage uh, of the germplasm evolved in the uh, breeding uh, of the improved lines, uh, these numbers appear to be fairly, uh, fairly low, but again, they are there and are available. Uh, if it, the numbers were be much higher, we wouldn't need a breeding program actually, and, and that is unlikely. Uh, given what we know about the characteristics of land races, of wild relatives, and so on. So the issue is not to me, are these genes, are the gene banks really used? Uh, they are, and they are very useful. To me, the issue is more, uh, how can we um, increase their efficiency? Now, from a breeding standpoint, um, I like to show this uh, pyramid here coming from a paper by Jim Kelly, who is a fellow uh, bean geneticist and breeder um, at uh, Michigan State University. And he and, and two of his students uh, published a paper on the, um, the breeding for yield in, in common bean. And this pyramid is actually quite illustrative because the uh, the breeding activities really involve elite by elite crosses normally, and that's what breeders prefer. That's where they can make the fastest progress from selection. But occasionally, there are new strains, new traits uh, that are necessary. And so I say that uh, figuratively, breeding, uh, breeders have to descend the pyramid and go to the bottom, and that's where the gene banks are. Uh, and conduct an intergene pool over the specific crosses or uh, access crop wild relative. And then going back up the pyramid, then to introduce, introgress these traits from the gene bank into the uh, elite by elite crosses. And so that is really the challenge. Uh, how do we increase the efficiency of this whole genetic conservation in gene banks? The pre-breeding and then eventually the breeding of improved cultivars. And a lot of what you will hear today is really about pre-breeding uh, rather than breeding elite by elite actually. So I um, thought that I would focus on uh, the uh, uh, six major challenges I see in gene bank utilization. Um, the first one is what I call the black box. What's in the gene bank, really? Um, Kaldi provided an, an impressive list of new traits, or new accessions that had been identified. But how do we get there? How do we make this work more efficient, this discovery work uh, more efficient? The second one is what I call lost in the woods. Uh, we have received germplasm from uh, gene banks, and I'll provide more detail about that. And very often the, the, the germplasm, understandably, is not adapted, but to the point where we cannot really evaluate this germplasm. So it stays there, and I will propose kind of a, a, a strategy to really address this uh, issue. The other, the third one is the, the sampling issue and especially the representativity of a collection. 
uh, this is a, a moving target. Uh, collections evolve, uh, especially by addition of new germplasm. Uh, but how do we know that it is really representative? And then the fourth one is to, I, I contend that we need to be more specific how to target our conservation and breeding operations. Which populations, which traits? This is, for example, not just drought tolerance, but what traits specifically are involved in drought tolerance? What type of drought stress are we talking about? And so which environment also plays a role? And then the fifth one is the availability of all these data in the suitable databases. And lastly, but not leastly, is the situation with international treaties and uh, intellectual property rights. Um, how does it affect the interchange of germplasm and the use of uh, germplasm? Uh, that is an important issue and it's unresolved for that. And I'll, I'll mention uh, an example to which we have contributed that dealt with uh, erroneous IP rights uh, on a germplasm imported in the US. So let's now um, talk about the experimental model. Uh, you will have heard that I work mostly on phaseolus. Um, it is from the standpoint of the study of genetic diversity, an extremely interesting genus because a lot of the, the genetic diversity has been shaped shaped by domestication. And genus itself, out of the 80 species here, and I'm citing here three references here that describe these 80 species, five have been domesticated. And two of them have been domesticated twice, actually. And so you see here uh, the different, uh, the seven domestications with their respective wild uh, progenitors. Um, um, and, and we uh, recently published a chapter in a book on population genomics uh, by Dr., uh, edited by Dr. Omra Jora of New Brunswick University. Uh, and uh, it's authored by Travis Parker. You will hear his name cited more often. He is a postdoc now in my lab uh, discussing the various aspects of the, these seven domestications. Now, the domestication here is kind of interesting, uh, primarily because we have different distributions. You see here the distribution of common bean, and I will come back to that, from northern Mexico to northwest Argentina. This is a distance of about 10,000 kilometers. You have lima bean, the wild progenitor here, the yellow dots, also a similar distribution. A runner bean is somewhat smaller. And then the most limited distribution is for year, the wild year bean here, a few locations in Guatemala. Okay. Um, and so you have these different degrees of domestication, which allows us to answer uh, questions about the effect of domestication on the genetic diversity. Uh, the species also have very different adaptations. Uh, you have, for example, tepary bean, which is of increasing interest because it comes from Northwest Mexico, Southwest US, and is very adapted to heat and drought stress, for example. Uh, in contrast, for, for example, runner bean, which is a high altitude, cool and wet environment, for example. So there is, all sorts of adaptations, all sorts of reproductive systems from allogamy to autogamy and so on, actually. So the first question I would like to address here is that kind of black box. What's in the collection, really? And most of the research in Phaseolus has focused on common bean because that is economically the most important uh, species but also, it is also the most domesticated species. It's grown for its dry bean, but also for its green bean. And that variation actually appeared 
from this distribution, which is again shown here from Northern Mexico to Northwest Argentina. Now, several markers have been used uh, in, um, to uh, unravel the or understand the genetic relationships among all these accessions. And it turns out that there is all of these phaseolo species originated in what is called now Mesoamerica, you could call it Mexico and Central America. That is really the center of origin of the genus. All of the domesticated uh, uh, phaseolo species have at least uh, one domestication in this Mesoamerican area. So we see here, this group here are all have a distribution in Mesoamerica. But there is this particular group here uh, as that has a distribution in the Southern Andes and this small group here in green that has a distribution in Ecuador and Northern Peru. And so this research has come to the conclusion by uh, that actually there were rare long distance dispersal events from the Mesoamerican area into the Andes. And this is re, uh, dispersed is bird mediated. And uh, the green area here is a dispersal event that took place about 400,000 years. And the purple area here is a dispersal event that took place about 100,000 years. Now, the green area here is of interest because it includes sequences that are ancestral, but they don't exist anymore in the area of origin of the genus and of the species here in Mexico. So we are kind of in this strange situation of having ancestral sequence uh, where, uh, outside the ancestral region. And that is certainly a motive to conserve, uh, but also the, the age uh, on the order of hundreds of thousands of years meaning means that uh, we have uh, genetic diversity in the Andes that is qualitatively different than what's uh, in, uh, found in Mexico. And I'll give you an example later on of disease resistances that are different here in the Andean area compared to the Mesoamerican area. So I illustrate this example. I use this example to illustrate how important it is to understand the genetic relationships uh, in a species and especially of its wild progenitor to understand the overall genetic diversity, but also the domestication patterns, okay? Now, if you look here to the right of the slide, this is principally about the domestications. There were two domestications in common bean, one of them here in central Mexico and the other somewhere in the Southern Andes. So the orange area and the purple area gave rise to domestications. The other areas, the blue area and the green area here are, uh, were not involved in domestication directly. And you see this here uh, reflected in this graph here, you have a split down the middle to the right, it is the Mesoamerican area. To the left, it is the Southern Andean domestication. And each of them has its wild relatives that are more closely related to the respective domesticates. And that, again, is a confirmation of what we have seen before since 1986, that there are two domestications. Now, what is the consequence for that, for genetic conservation? It's clear that we need to conserve both area, even though the Andean uh, area is derived from the Mesoamerican area, as I said, qualitatively, it is different. Um, and um, we also have, generally speaking, two different breeding programs, one to address the Mesoamerican uh, cultivars and the other to address the Andean cultivars, okay? So here, what you see, it's the same type of study, but involving primarily lines that are included in breeding programs. For example, at SEAT or in some of the African countries, 
uh, and, and you see, again, that split down the middle, which indicates a double domestication. Here it's to the left is Mesoamerican, to the right it's Andean, but you see also further subdivision. For example, you see um, land races. You have here a group of Andean land races. Uh, this group here is a group of Mesoamerican land races from southern Mexico, and they fulfill a very important role as donors of uh, disease resistance. Okay. Uh, you see also uh, breeding objectives represented. This group here represent the activities of breeders in the Midwest of the United States who have converted varieties with a prostrate growth habit into varieties with an upright growth habit amenable to, um, to direct combining, for example. Uh, and then you see also certain eco-geographic races that are represented here. You see this group here are the ecogeographic race Mesoamerica. It is typically a low altitude, hot and humid. Uh, whereas here we have this group here is an Andean uh, ecogeographic race, the race Nueva Granada, uh, which has uh, often a high frequency of upright cultivar, fairly large seeds, elongated, and I'll give you an example later on. You can also look at what is the diversity that is present in farmers' fields. Uh, we did a study in uh, a region of uh, Uganda, of western Uganda, Hoima County. Uh, it's a fairly small county, but we analyzed 190 uh, farms uh, were able to secure a sample of their uh, bean diversity. And you see here the, 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 the diversity that we analyzed with uh, SNP markers uh, in the context of a broader uh, representation of the germplasm. And the red, the red branches here are the diversity that was present among these 190 cultivars. And I would say that that is quite impressive. This is diversity maintained at the farm level. Um, if you analyze then these individual lines, we see that um, if you look at all the samples, uh, they contain uh, both uh, Andean and Mesoamerican, uh, types. Uh, and among those farmers that uh, were involved in a participatory varietal selection exercise by SEAT uh, Africa, you see the effect of these participatory activities in the increased diversity uh, figured by the red dots here. And so um, these participatory activities increase the diversity at the farm level. Uh, what is already quite diverse. Um, another uh, sign of the importance of farmers in the selection of diversity is this so-called seed and gufu, which is a selection made by several farmers for a very particular type of variety and a, seed, a, mot a red mottled seed type and they appear to be able to maintain the purity of this particular farmer variety. Now, I wanted to transition. Most of these, what I've talked about, about the black box were genotypic uh, evaluations, but clearly we have to combine this to the phenotype. The genotypic evaluation provide us with a, an idea of the genetic relationships but not necessarily of the agronomic traits or the phenotypic traits. Um, so here, this is a, an example of a transition uh, to the phenotype, and it illustrates the pattern of coevolution um, with uh, pathogen. I see that somebody is raising, uh, Mukul Kumar is raised, uh, has raised his hand. Should I uh, stop here? or answer the question.
well, until I get an answer, I will continue. So what you see uh, on the left side of the screen is an evaluation. Uh, what was collected were wild beans uh, from Mexico, Ecuador, and Argentina. So these were Andean. This was the intermediate group, the green group I showed you, and then Argentina, which is an Andean. So Mesoamerican intermediate Andean. Uh, and you collect both the seeds of these wild beans as well as pathogen strains from the same plants in, again, Mexico, intermediate and uh, Andean area. And you evaluate whether there is a compatible reaction, which means actually a susceptible reaction on the part of beans. And the black squares here show the compatible reaction. And it, it shows that actually these Mexican wild beans are primarily susceptible to the strains of the pathogen from the same area. And so this is true for Mexico, the true for the intermediate area, and true for Argentina. So there is a coevolution between the pathogen. Now, what is the practical application for that? It is precisely that if you want to have a resistant Argentine, uh, Argentinian uh, material, an Andean material, where do you go for resistance? Well, you go here, um, you go uh, to uh, see to the Mexico, which has uh, no uh, susceptibility to the same pathogen, okay? And vice versa, if you want to have a resistant Mexican genotype, you need to go to Argentina, okay? So you need to be able to make crosses uh, between the two gene pools, uh, which uh, happens, which is uh, definitely possible. Why do we ha have this reaction? Uh, the same collaboration with uh, French workers at the University of Paris show that there are clusters of resistant gene, where there's a large one on chromosome four of beans, and that cluster is has generated both Andean and Mesoamerican resistances. Okay. And so you see major genes, co Y, co Z, and co 9, but also quantitative traits uh, indicated by the boxes here at the level of leaves, uh, seeds, and pods. Okay. And this cluster actually predates the separation 19 million years ago between soybean and phaseolus. And so, again, it helps us understand to study where do we go for genetic diversity. Clearly, uh, this example here at the level, at the left, shows that we need to collect the entire distribution uh, of wild beans, uh, and not just the one in Mexico that has the highest molecular diversity. Uh, we need to also look at the uh, diversity in the Andes. Um, let me then also continue. I mentioned mostly genotypic uh, evaluations, uh, phenotypic evaluation in terms of disease resistances. Um, I'll give you here three examples where uh, we are trying to increase the efficiency of phenotypic evaluations. Uh, the two first two examples are for um, growth in general or photosynthesis traits and using drones, uh, you can measure the growth rate of the canopy at the various stages, especially we did it for the early vigor, um, early growth vigor. Uh, we think that grain legumes suffer from generally uh, poor growth and poor uh, low speed of growth in the initial phases. And so uh, Travis Parker uh, used drones to actually follow the, the growth. Uh, and he also conducted a genetic study. He developed a recombinant bred population between a slow grower and a fast grower and was able to identify then uh, QTLs. And clearly this approach can be uh, followed in a germplasm, uh, even a, an increase uh, to, to follow the growth, the speed of, of the growth um, 
uh, of the different germ plasma accessions. I'm involved right now in a experiment, mostly with uh, physiologists in my department who look at uh, drought tolerance in a magic population. Uh, Troy Magny is one of the colleagues here, and he erected this tower here uh, with uh, cameras at different uh, heights, and they can then follow uh, measure photosynthesis related traits uh, of these different plots. So we have here a static uh, as well as a dynamic or non-static uh, measurement of plant traits uh, at a high throughput. The third example here is conducted by uh, Kimberly Gibson, who is one of uh, my PhD students, and Emily Bick, who is a former graduate, uh, an entomologist, uh, former graduate of UC Davis. She works at the University of Copenhagen now, and they are working with a startup company who has developed these sensors here that can follow insects in the field. And we are trying to identify um, differences or resistances against the uh, what is called Ligus, uh, Hesperus. It is the major major um, pest of lima bean in, in California. And you can actually train these sensors to identify the Ligus insects, but also the, um, the predators of Ligus or the hyperparasites. So there is both a genetic component and a cultural component in terms of uh, biological control, actually. And I believe that these approaches are absolutely essential if we are to increase our efficiency of phenotypic evaluation. Uh, and uh, both the genotypic and phenotypic evaluations ought to be applied to uh, germplasm collections uh, so that people can actually get away from this black box uh, phenomenon. So um, I would um, then turn to the, the second, um, the second um, issue that I'm raising and uh, this kind of the lack of basic adaptation in joint plasma collection. This is a perfectly normal situation. You would expect this, but how do we get ourselves out of this problem? So I, I uh, define what I would call basic adaptation. It's can the plant complete its cycle and for seed propagated uh, species, uh, at least produce some, some seeds, for example, go through the vegetative and reproductive parts of the cycle. Uh, we are not actually dealing with what I would call advanced adaptation. It is the optimization of performance. That is a breeding process that comes afterwards. But it would be great if we could already get this, just the basic adaptation. And I'll give you an example. We received uh, several years ago, a collection of lima bean from the, uh, um, from the CIAT uh, genetic resources unit. Only 10% of these 300 accessions flowered and set at least some seeds. That means that 270 accessions did not flower. This is a tremendous loss, and I would say it's almost a tragedy that we can't evaluate these 270 accessions, for example, for these uh, potential ligus resistance. So what is needed, actually? I think it's a, I think it's a different approach. It's not novel. Uh, it's uh, what I would call germplasm conversion. People have done this before, like for in sorghum, for example. And what you need to do is to map and preferably identify these basic adaptation genes. And, and they are very often domestication genes. So you have flowering and photoperiod genes. Uh, you have growth habit genes. Another aspect here of this lima bean is that they're all climbing types. Well, it's good in certain types of agriculture, but in something like California, we would like to see bush types. So how do we convert a climbing type into a bush type? Uh, we also would like to avoid 
avoid seed dispersal for wild types. Uh, and so lack of pod dehiscence. And in California, they like, for whatever reason, they like white seeds. So we need to have a gene for white, on a layer for white seeds, for example. So as I said, it has been done before, but the approach here is not to take adapted germplasm and introgress a trait of interest like insect resistance. It's actually take the unadapted, uh, the unadapted germplasm and introgress a limited set of adaptation genes like photoperiod, for example, like bush growth habit. These would be two genes only. And then once you have selected for those, for the rest, you can continue doing pedigree uh, selection. And so this would make the germplasm much more available. So um, we conducted this uh, study on domestication syndrome uh, quite some time. This was published in 1996. And from a scientific standpoint, it is very heartening to me that now the genes that we had mapped, but not really isolated, that they are coming out in, but in the location that we had predicted based on the an RFLP mapping, a crude RFLP mapping. And so it is really, um, to me, very satisfying. And uh, this actually shows a summary of these genes that have been isolated and really in the location that we had predicted. We have been, we mapped here the uh, isolated first gene for determinacy. Um, others have, uh, with our materials actually, have mapped and isolated a gene for photoperiod sensitivity. Uh, recently, they identified a gene for seed dormancy in exactly the location we had identified as a QTL. Uh, you have the gene here for white seeds. It's the P locus uh, mapped on the chromosome 7. And then we are now working on elucidating the genetics of pod shattering. Um, and so, again, this is... Um, so some of these genes are the genes that we need to integrate into the germplasm to make it amenable to evaluation. Okay. Uh, I will skip in the interest of time, but as I said, it's the you take a domesticated unadapted germplasm and you cross it to a domesticated adapted germplasm that has these individual genes for adaptation. Uh, it should be a fairly simple process. Uh, it can be done with markers because we have the sequences, we have mapped them. And so uh, We'll see how that uh, turns out. The third issue I want to talk about is the sampling or representativity of the collection. I'll give you the example of wild common bean again. Um, the collections are a, um, I'm sorry, uh, collections are a dynamic uh, concept, uh, constantly evolving, mostly by addition. So how do we know that, uh, and since when do we know that wild common has such an extensive uh, distribution over 10,000 kilometers? Well, it started in the 1940s in Argentina and Guatemala. Why such a disjunct distribution? People should have scratched their head. In the 1950s, you see some individuals timidly collecting some materials, uh, then uh, in addition to Guatemala, uh, in southern Mexico, also in Colombia, in Peru, as well as uh, Argentina. In the 1960s, there was a major effort in Mexico, and you see then a large number of wild bean collections made in, in, in Mexico. In the 1970s, you start uh, the pace starts picking up um, in different uh, countries, and it really breaks open in the 1980s uh, with a, a large number of collection. You see then that this distribution is taking shape. Uh, and there are gaps in this, but they are likely to be real gaps in the distribution and not gaps in the collection. Okay. Then the 1990s, you see a continuation of that. 
And then after the year 2000, it stops. And it still, it stops. We have now overall distribution, but uh, there is almost no collection being done. Why is that? Um, we can discuss this, um, but the fact of the matter is that, yes, we know the distribution of the wild common bean, but should we continue collecting and what should we be collecting? I have some ideas about that. So this is a table that uh, reflects that and you see the two decades here, 1980s, 1990s, uh, with a tremendous number of uh, collections. The type of data that were used were initially roadmaps, which believe it or not, uh, sometimes can be state secrets or military secrets uh, in the Andes. Uh, we used molecular diversity to argue that we needed uh, to fill the, some of these gaps. We have the global weather data to indicate what type of climate does the, uh, the, do these populations live in. And now more recently, species distribution models also. Okay. So we can also use then uh, in terms of studying the representativity, this is in a sense the genealogy of common bean. Uh, you see here a, a lineage that started out probably more than a, about a million years ago. You have a first dispersal event towards Ecuador and northern Peru about 500,000 years ago. A second long distance dispersal event about 100,000 years ago. And then that lineage ends up forming the Mesoamerican uh, gene pool. This dispersal event is the Andean gene pool, both of which were domesticated and eventually disseminated around the world. So that is the view, what we know about the diversity. We can then evaluate, for example, what is, is the USDA core collection which represents a, is supposed to represent a representative subsample. Uh, how uh, is it representative? Well, what I've done is to take the same graph and uh, I've grayed out the area, the populations that are not represented here. And you see that there are significant uh, omissions in this core collection. Now, this is not a criticism of this particular core collection. It was one of the first one that was uh, set up um, at the beginning of the 1990s, but it's definitely um, should be updated with what we now know uh, about the genetic diversity and the genetic materials that are represented in the USDA uh, Phaseolus uh, collection. Okay. Now, I mentioned that uh, I had some ideas about um, the, what should we collect nowadays? A lot of the collections so far have investigated the distribution of a taxon like wild uh, common bean uh, by going following roads uh, in the potential areas of distribution. Uh, this is the case here. You see a road here and lo and behold, we found wild uh, common bean here against this rock face. Um, we decided then to look around and lo and behold, yes, there was another uh, popular uh, series of plants here. Interestingly, these are wild common bean growing on wild maize, uh, just like the uh, cropping system that we see very often around the world now with beans growing physically on top of uh, a maize, domesticated maize. Uh, you also see here another example uh, of uh, wild beans growing on, on, uh, on uh, wild maize. We see that the population actually is not just along the roads, which is a favorable environment for these wild populations, but further down away from the road. And this, we really have very little idea of what diversity grows away from the roads, actually. You see also here another wild uh, plant. And what you see here 
is in that field, this is maize, but it's really a hybrid between domesticated and wild maize, probably backcrossed towards maize. And this is then a form of wild squash, all in this fairly small field. So there is tremendous diversity. I've also mentioned the example of collecting pathogens from wild populations. And so the model that I, I propose is to move from a geographic exploration to an agroecological exploration. So that uh, because part, crops are part of agroecosystems, the crops don't grow on their own. That is an invention of the modern industrial agriculture. Uh, crops uh, are like here, uh, growing with other crops like maize and squash. So you have crop populations, you have crop interactions. They in turn have pathogens and pests, but they're also beneficial microorganisms, both endogenous and exo exogenous uh, microbiomes. In the case of beans, the rhizobia uh, are very important. And so I would argue that if and when we continue explorations, we should take these other organisms into account and the facilities of gene banks ought to follow um, this evolution. Let me then go to the fourth uh, area is the targeting of, um, of traits. Uh, I think that which population, which trait, which environment, there is an inherent difficulty in evaluating wild species, wild relative. I'll take the example of wild beans here. The, there is a yield evaluation. Uh, it's very difficult to evaluate yield, or seed yield, for example, in a wild relative. Uh, they are not selected for that, uh, unlike domesticated uh, plants. Uh, there are different selection regimes altogether. Uh, wild beans disperse their seed explosively at maturity. How do you want to evaluate yield in that situation? Uh, there is also a stronger population structure and a more localized adaptation than in the domesticated descendant. And so uh, it is very difficult to, um, to choose for example, high yielding uh, wild, popu uh, wild populations. That is almost uh, an oxymoron, it's, 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 uh, it's nonsense. So we set up an experiment with Jorge Berni, a former student that involved, actually, uh, we wanted to see if we could identify drought tolerant wild beans. So we took uh, three populations of wild beans along a, um, a rainfall gradient from Durango in the north, 500 millimeters, to with Tenango in Guatemala, uh, almost 2,000 millimeters. Um, <clears throat> the populations were crossed, one back cross and four selfings, and there was a selection for earliness and photoperiod insensitivity. And then once we had these populations, they were tested under well-watered and terminal drought. Uh, this is what the population looked like. You see here in the field, um, the, the green area, uh, it, it's caused by lateness in spite of the, the selection. And that is a, a disadvantage compared to the domesticated breeding part of the nursery where you see materials already well advanced, okay? So the populations were genotyped, were phenotyped, and the, the central result is that we were able to increase the yield of the domesticated tester uh, only in the crosses that involved the two populations from the driest area. The population from the wettest location uh, did not either increase or decrease the yield. Now this to us was a positive result because it says Yes, we can increase um, yield under drought stress conditions, and we can actually choose specific populations uh, to that effect, in spite of the difficulties in evaluating directly uh, these wild populations. OK. 
Okay, so the choice of population is important. Uh, we now know how to do this. We can use GIS, for example, to, to select the driest environment. The testing environment is important. And the choice of traits, as it turns out, earlier experiment had shown that wild populations uh, in dry environments have a deeper root system compared to others that come from wetter areas. Also, these wild beans, when you subject them to uh, drought, they continue growing in spite of the drought, unlike the domesticated types. So we have two specific traits here, the root system, as well as the continuation of uh, growth that are specific traits that can be used to screen for both wild and domesticated germplasm. And so it, 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 it's really the specific trait. It's not just drought tolerance. No, it is specific uh, drought stress tolerant traits. Uh, I also believe that in the future, we will have to take care of uh, consumer preferences more than we have done. Uh, this is the, uh, the question here is, you see common bean is the most consumed bean species, but you have tepary bean and lima bean. Each of them have some resistance to drought. The question is, will the consumer be agreeable to the consumption of these other bean species? Okay, but that we don't know. But we work already within common bean to develop uh, improved heirloom-like varieties that have increased yield and virus resistance. Uh, these are completely different from the normal commercial types and expands actually the use of the diversity contained in germplasm collections, whether they are public or uh, commercial uh, collections. So I'm getting now to towards the end of my talk. There is a problem, uh, an issue that I would like to raise, and that is the databases. I don't think that there is really a satisfactory database um, that really combines all the, the data uh, and can be interchanged. Uh, I've heard with interest that Carl did mention about the DNA fingerprinting. Um, what I would like to see is the database is that where you can look at uh, or can switch around from phenotypic to genotypic data back and forth. Uh, an example of where the, the benefit when we have these phenotypic data is, for example, the, the gene bank at SIAT has the photos of a large number of its accessions. Now to breeders, this is extremely useful uh, because the preference of the consumer, and so the breeding target, uh, an important part, are the, the seed types, the color, the shape, the patterning, and so on. And we have used this information actually to test for the representation of the core collection, as I discussed before. We have also used part shattering uh, data from the USDA to find that the uh, Durango race in northern Mexico is really tolerant uh, to uh, part shattering, which makes sense given the aridity of the environment. So we need uh, more integration of different types of data. And I would argue that the research community of a crop, for example, the Phaseolus community, uh, ought to have this partial responsibility of curation of the data as well. And then finally, the, uh, the constraint here is the these intellectual property rights and international treaties. And to what extent do they affect the free interchange of germplasm? Maybe we won't get back to a free interchange, but at least a fairly uh, easy interchange so that research towards applying uh, the genetic diversity can proceed. I will give you an example where I was involved with that. Um, at one time in 1999, 
a patent and a plant variety protection certificate were awarded to an individual who claimed to have developed a yellow bean variety. Uh, and it's this particular, you gave him the name of Enola, uh, but you see that in Mexico, they had similar varieties and as well as in Peru. And actually the Mexican bean breeders had developed a new commercial class resulting from the cross between a azufrado, uh, so a sulfur bean, and a canario, a Peruvian canario. And so that generated that new class, azufrado peruano. Um, the bean community was really, uh, I would say, befuddled, if not upset, about this type of patent. I took it upon myself to develop a small research project uh, and we fingerprinted these uh, small collection of beans containing both yellow and non-yellow beans. And you see here the marker of choice at that time, and that's 20 years ago, were AFLPs. Some of you may remember those, but it allowed us to fingerprint these materials. Uh, and the result of that was, again, you know, you see here, uh, principal coordinate analysis, again, the split Mesoamerican versus Andean, because the cross involved these Peruvian Andean Canarios, you see most of the yellow bean uh, were actually Andean. And Enola here has the same fingerprint as AP87. So we were able to identify a potential source of this variety, which was not an original breeding effort. Uh, through a course of multiple appeals, uh, eventually the court that is just below the Supreme Court of the United States uh, decided to cancel many of the claims made in that patent. And effect, in effect, the patent became um, null and void, actually. And so um, I felt that we had um, contributed to this decision, um, uh, which was really a, a, almost a fraudulent uh, claim uh, to uh, original breeding product, actually. But, uh, and, I, and so I was very pleased to hear uh, Kaldeep mentioning that a lot of the fingerprinting going on in, in the collection, because I think that that is an important point to maintain the ownership or sovereignty over this, uh, this germplasm. So in conclusion then, and I thank you for your attention and for your patience, um, I mentioned the black box problem. We need faster and better genotyping and phenotyping of the collection. The problem of lack of basic adaptation, uh, I propose this germplasm convention, conversion, where you see marker-assisted introgression of a limited set of domestication adaptation uh, genes. The representativity, we need to continue evaluating the representation of these collection. And uh, there ought to be a new model for exploration based on agroecological uh, sampling. The targeting issue is we need to make an informed choice of accessions and populations, uh, specific phenotypes or traits and also the environments of origin and testing. And that way we'll be able to make a better choice of the germplasm and selection in the progenies using that germplasm. The database problem, I think that that is a continuing problem. Um, some databases are better than others, but I really, um, we need to improve on that. And I think that the respective crop communities can contribute that through their uh, curation. Uh, the, uh, the thicket of IP rights and international treaties, I think it prevents and slows down the active interchange of germplasm and associated information. Um, and I think that it's too bad. I think that there is a sense of urgency about feeding uh, an increasing uh, population uh, throughout the world. And so that's uh, in um, what I had to tell you, um, and I'm certainly open for questions. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for taking us through the evolutionary relationships to phenotypic evaluation, to genotyping, to mass, to domestication, sampling problems, and databases. Uh, the whole gamut of research in PGR that you have provided us. I think we are all truly enlightened by your talk. I think uh, Sir has already mentioned that he's ready to take a few questions. We should be a little brief as we are pressed for time. May I? Sunil Archer from NBP. Yes. Dr. Sunil Archer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Paul, for this fantastic lecture. It was just like uh, Snoot's tail mass with rhythm, flow, and variety. Thank you very much. You have thrown, you have thrown a dice of uh, six faces, and uh, we know that how to identify priority. My specific question is on the on the centricity of the, the crop diversity. Centricity, the question of centricity. People are coming up with uh, various theories, uh, particularly in uh, in barley. Particularly in barley, they have shown that it is not uh, mono or oligocentric. It can be a continuous uh, geographic region. So we have shown some some glimpses of uh, a similar kind of uh, non-canonical centricity in in physiology. So what is your take on uh, uh, for gene banks to work on some kind of uh, uh, identifying the centricity issue so that we actually focus on uh, proper uh, uh, collections as well as uh, 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 resolving these disputes uh, between different countries. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure that I fully understood your question. I'm sorry about that. Um, I, I, I just repeat, may, I repeat? Yeah. Yeah. may I repeat if you would like? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is regarding the centricity of uh, crop origin and uh, diversity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you have shown uh, some glimpses of, glimpses of that in, in Faziolus, yeah. that it need not be canonically monocentric, as no. we have studied in textbooks. It can be multiple places. People have shown in barley that uh, a very yeah. typical genomic exercise in barley has shown that it is it, it can be a geographically continuous uh, region. Yeah. So what is your take on uh, uh, the centricity research by gene bank? How can we work on that? Well, you know, I, I think the uh, what you should strive for is really to be able to combine the the germplasm um, in the in the case of barley, it's both the one of the federal of the fertile crescent and the one the further east of maybe uh, what is it Tibet or the northern India. Um, they ought to be both accessible to the user, just like in beans, the, both the Mesoamerican and the Andean ought to be accessible. Now, I know that the treaty, the CBD, for example, says the sovereignty um, is, lies with the, the individual countries. And that may seem to, um, that's the problem that I'm alluding to, is that it may seem to prevent or slow down the interchange of germplasm. Um, I, I, th th that is what we need to, to fight, actually, I think. Because if you were to conduct a breeding program just for Andean bean or Mesoamerican bean, or in the case of barley, um, you would be missing out on a significant portion of the germplasm. And so I know that it's becoming every time more complicated. It's not just the seeds. Now they are also talking about the, uh, the information, for example, traditional knowledge, but also the DNA sequence information becomes an issue. I yeah. think that all of these things make uh, things more difficult and they have not promoted the use of germplasm. And that there is a cost for that, actually. Uh, it assumes that uh, the reasoning is that if you can control it, you're going to benefit from it. I, I'm, I, I question that assumption. Yeah. Because if it stays in the gene bank, it's not going to be put to use. 
Uh, I know that maybe some people will disagree with me, uh, but I think the best germ plasm is the one that gets used and evaluated. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much, sir. I'm not sure if I answered your question. I'm sorry, but uh, maybe we're going to have a discussion later on. <laughs> if there are, uh, Dr. Kuldeep Singh, sir. So please unmute yourself. I think sir is not uh, able okay, to unmute yourself. Okay, yes. now, now it's good. Now it's less good. Thank you. Thank you. I think Archik, you need to ask the organizers, uh, the, the host, that uh, he really needs to allow us to unmute. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much for taking us for a beautiful journey of, from uh, gene banks to the breeding lines, how we can really do it. Uh, you, you have shown a beautiful method, beautiful way how the things have been done for beans, and especially in one of the continents now. How do you think that if we really have to do it at a global level, how can this to be replicated for different crops at a global level? Because ultimately we need to see the overall diversity, especially the ones which you have shown that uh, the resistance genes and some important genes may be found across the, uh, the domestication sites or so. So in, for example, if we take a crop, major crops like wheat, uh, or rice or for that purpose where the, where the germ plasm is pretty very, very large, how can, how can we really do it uh, in such crops globally? Which crops are you referring to? If I if I talk of major crops like rice and wheat or maize, yeah. Um, the first time I hear that phaseolus would be an example for rice and maize, I think. I'm, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we have a pretty good idea because we started off studying the wild progenitor that we have a good understanding of domestication. And as I said, in beans, common bean, that was the first example where we fairly conclusively could demonstrate a double domestication, multiple domestication. Uh, I think in rice, it's more complicated. I'm not sure why. Um, I say we have one domestication, one and a half, two or even three domestication, depending on the paper you read, actually. But understanding that will make you understand how the genetic diversity is organized. At the same time, you have to collect these other organisms like these pathogens to understand the diversity of the pathogen and then the interaction. We did not do that only in the Americas. We have done this also in Africa. The, the so-called so ABC project, the African Bean Consortium, the, the students study the diversity of the pathogen as well as the bean host. And so they know what the diversity is of the pathogen, especially of the virulence, and they know if there is resistance among the local germplasm, or do they have to import germplasm from the gene bank? So I think that the model is perfectly extensible to other crops. It starts with trying to understand the, the, the genetic diversity. And both at the wild level and at the domesticated level. The paper of 1991 that describes the ecogeographic races in common bean is a citation has become a citation classic. And I don't mean to brag about it, but it's how useful that concept has been 
for bean breeders or anybody who is using bean diversity. Uh, and it's based partly on molecular markers, partly on the distribution of phenotypes like disease resistances, growth habits, adaptation, and so on, actually. So from 1991, so that was fairly early on, actually. So I, I, I think that it's extensible to other crops. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Dr. Shashni, if he's able to unmute, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Paul. It's a wonderful lecture. I have a simple question to ask. Uh, when we predict the timeline of domestication, so I know there are different prediction programs and we go for the evolutionary significance, evolutionary aspect of the uh, different species or the DNA. But how far do you think these are correct when you predict? Because you have not seen how the crops are being domesticated and they are being grown in different regions. Thank you. Yeah. Well, on one, on one hand, I would say there was always an element of uncertainty um, because we weren't there. <laughs> um, but I think that there is now increasingly a combination of DNA sequence and also archaeobotanical remains that can be dated. And through accelerated mass spectrometry, you can actually, uh, you only need a fairly small amount of biological material to date the, uh, the, the remain, actually. Uh, and there are some striking cases where people have been able to see a correspondence between the DNA data and the, uh, the carbon-14 dating, actually. So I, I, I think that it's possible within, you know, being a certain level uh, of precision, actually, which is probably on the order of several hundreds of years, uh, even one or 2,000 years. Actually. Now, maybe you want something more specific. Um, but um, I, I think personally, I'm, I'm satisfied with that. And we see it fairly consistently across crop in a certain uh, region. I would be more concerned about the absence of archeolo archeological or archeobotanical remains. Um, because the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. And many times, you know, the absence of uh, archaeobotanical remains doesn't mean anything, actually. So hopefully that will maybe provide some elements of answer. Thank, thank you so much, sir. Manjusha, uh, Manjusha, I think, I think uh, um, uh, Professor I... Tia Sharma perhaps uh, would like to intervene. So, sir, so, so, Dr. Tia Sharma, please. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, good morning, Dr. Paul. It was really indeed an excellent question, uh, presentation which you have made. And, uh, and, uh, and while referring to co-evolution of host and pathogen, uh, have you looked at the path pathogen population of common bean and common beans and what was that population? How did you look at that? Uh, you mean of the pathogens? Yes. Yeah. So we did it both molecularly as well as uh, phenotypically by inoc cross inoculating the, um, the beans on which they were found, from which they were isolated. And so there is a one to one relationship. That is very important uh, because people, uh, that's how we found that you have um, Mesoamerican strains on Mesoamerican beans and vice versa for the Andean. Most people you know, skipped the, the isolation, the one-to-one -one relationship actually, and just dealt with it geographically. Um, 
Uh, so uh, the, the molecular marker we choose that, that I chose, for example, right at the beginning were like rapid markers. We wouldn't be using these nowadays, uh, but there are other uh, markers uh, from sequences that are fairly conserved, actually. And so it's um, both genotypic as well as phenotypic. And likewise for the host. It's markers to see is it Andean or Mesoamerican, but also the susceptibility to the, the pathogen. Actually. Okay. And Thank you, sir. If I could, if I may, another element is that we did this not in the Andean and Mesoamerican centers of diversity. We did it outside, in Brazil, and in Africa, because I reasoned that in those outside, you have both gene pools, host gene pools represented. In in Brazil, you have 20% Andean, 80% Mesoamerican beings. In Malawi, it's the reverse. You have 80% Andean, 20% Mesoamerican. So the pathogen, in a sense, can choose if it's going to infect a Mesoamerican being or an Andean being. Okay. And so leaving that opportunity. So there you have the possibility. And we see that there was a presence for a certain gene pool, and not just the two equally. So that was an important distinction. Okay. I'm sorry for interrupting, ma'am. No, no, sir. Uh, I thank you again. And I think uh, there is one question by Costa Fanda uh, on the chat box. I think uh, sir will read it and uh, reply to it. And uh, since we do not have uh, too much time to interact now, I think uh, I would ask all the participants to kindly uh, chat and directly talk to uh, Dr. Paul Gibbs. We are now moving on to uh, uh, having a release of our publications. Yeah. By... Uh, Manjusha, Manjusha, one second. Yeah. 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 Professor Paul has been standing ever since he has started talking. Uh, yes, we are we are all sitting. <laughs> we are all sitting in our rooms comfortably. The, Paul is standing there. Uh, if uh, uh, Professor Paul, the studio, uh, we, we request you to stay with us uh, till these couple of things are released. And one of which is uh, the point which you raised, uh, one of the database kind of thing. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So I don't you, mind standing. That's how I teach. I, I find that I'm more dynamic than if I'm sitting. I feel. So uh, uh, we would like you, uh, Dr. T. R. Sharma, sir, Dr. Uh, D. K. Yadav, sir, to please release a few publications. If we were here, I mean, uh, having a in-person uh, meeting, I think we would be able to meet the uh, developers and the uh, authors of these uh, publications. Uh, I would request all the authors to kindly, un, uh, I mean, show their videos. At least we can have a look at your faces while we are doing this. Uh, first in the lineup is uh, the folder. Are the folders from uh, NBPGR Regional Station Jodhpur? These are in Hindi. Uh, one is Teliki Jai Vivitta Ka Aisrujan Me Upyog by Vijay Singh Meena, Rashmi Yadav, Neelam Shikhawat, Kartar Singh, and Kuldeep Singh. The other one is uh, Ek Nazar Me, uh, Rashtriya Padap, Anuvanshik Sansadhan Bureau, Jodhpur. This is by Kartar Singh, Vijay Singh Meena, Neelam Shekhawat, Veena Gupta, and Kuldeep Singh. The third one is Padap, Anuvanshik Sansadhano Ka Prabandhan. This is by uh, Neelam Shekhawat, Vijay Singh Meena, Kartar Singh, Veena Gupta, and Kuldeep Singh. The uh, next one is from uh, Regional Station Bhuvali. It is an information brochure on cultivation of kiwi in Uttarakhand Hills. This is again in Hindi and it has the authors are K.M. Rai, Mamta Arya, Anuj Sharma, P.S. Mehta and Veena Gupta. Uh, the, another one is uh, genus Sizamum L in India, an illustrated guide for species identification. This is a booklet uh, that is based on the information of uh, exploratory trips, morphological studies undertaken in the experimental fields, and uh, herbarium studies in reputed herbaria. 
and uh, the authors are Dr. K. Pradeep, uh, Suma Parimalan, Rashmi Yadav, Swapti, and uh, Reshma. And uh, the next uh, one is PGR Clin. It is an application which is uh, uh, going to be used for climate smart PGR management. The developer for this is Dr. Sunil Archer, uh, officer in charge, uh, AKMU, NBPGR. And uh, we would like all the dignitaries to kindly uh, launch this uh, application. And I would request Dr. Archak to kindly speak about it. Thank you very much. Uh, um, thank you very much indeed. Uh, this is uh, uh, PGR CLIM. This is called as PGR CLIM. It is an on online tool to achieve climate ready gene bank. Uh, this is the first initiative from our side. Uh, because to be climate ready gene bank, uh, have to follow a twin track approach of designating pre adapted germplasm for immediate direct use or varietal development, as well as to identify vulnerable areas for collection and conservation of germplasm. Uh, we had a TCAPS funded project, CG TCAPS funded project um, from 2011 to 15, where we georeferenced more than 60,000 indigenous accessions uh, in 10 target crops. Uh, and uh, what we did was to uh, link uh, the climate data and the passport data and carried out clustering, climate matching, identifying vulnerable areas, designating pre adapted material, and eventually we developed the climate maps. And uh, a lot of work has been done on that. Uh, but that was that generated uh, only uh, static climate maps, which were in fact inaugurated by uh, DG in 2016. But then, then we thought that uh, uh, these must be available to researchers uh, to carry out their own analysis in an interactive fashion, which is why in uh, ICR National Fellow Project, we developed uh, uh, climate maps in ArcMap 10.1. But that was also, again, uh, one has to host it on... Uh, on a, a GIS server. And here comes the role of uh, Indian Agricultural Statistical Research Institute, IASRI. Um, the purpose of making PGR CLIM available to researchers could, uh, that was possible because of IASRI. The team uh, showed a proactive approach in redesigning the application, the latest version of uh, ArcGIS, and then they have hosted it on 10.8 version of the ArcGIS server on Krishi Geo Portal. I'll just quickly thank uh, people who were involved in this. The study was possible because of the proactive initiative of Professor Kailash Panchal, at that time the director of NBPGR, and Professor Pramod Agrawal, uh, CCAF's regional director, as well as uh, Dr. Prem Mathur, who was the regional director at that time in the biodiversity. Uh, we all know that uh, PGR work, plant genetic resources work, is a teamwork always, and contributions of all the past and present colleagues of NBPGR in collecting germplasm is acknowledged, without which this would not have been possible. PGR CLIM tool is an excellent example of collaboration between different institutes, national and international. At this point of time, it is between NBPGR, uh, our team. Uh, I thank Anuj, Firoj, and uh, Ratnesh, people there who are involved, as well as ISRI, Rajendra Prasad, Anshu, and Mukesh. Now, I request uh, this to be shared, please, uh, from NBPGR. I'll just quickly show in uh, two minutes uh, how does it look like. Um, Vijay or Ratnesh? I will stop sharing then. Yeah. Um, would you like to share there, uh, Vijay? Quickly. Thank you. Uh, this is how it looks like. Uh, we have multiple layers on here. We have both uh, um, uh, state level boundaries, national district level boundaries, so that one can uh, uh, one can scan information from multiple layers and then take out information both uh, as uh, of the administrative boundaries as well as uh, agroecological regions. We have a soil uh, map. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, predicted data of uh, climate, both temperature as well as uh, rainfall, past, present, and uh, near future and uh, far future. And uh, we, have, uh, we can select uh, different crops. Uh, for example, here I would like to request uh, people to let's say quickly work on. We have used uh, uh, 10 crops here as well as uh, um, Mm -hmm. different, let's say, in, in two of the crops, wild relatives we have used. This is a pilot project. We wanted to learn from this so that we, we can extend this work um, in future. 
So let's say we have selected here brinjal crop wild relatives. We select multiple layers, uh, future, let's say the, yeah, and uh, just run it. And we can see how we can take out the data. Once we can do that, uh, all we have to do is to just uh, select uh, different layers and then export it to Excel. So the people who are who are interested to access these, the collection points, these uh, we use these um, uh, the geo codes from where these uh, have been collected over a period of time as the surrogate points for their actual occurrence at this point of time, so that it helps us in finding out gaps, in finding out uh, uh, vulnerable areas today and tomorrow. Uh, can we see in some other crops if they're ready? I, I would love to, uh, in fact, demonstrate this in detail, but uh, because of shortage of time, I, I'm going to share the URL on the chat box. I request uh, colleagues to just test that one then give the feedback. Uh, we have developed uh, some analysis, but uh, that uh, any analysis is limited by one's own imagination. So this tool is now available for everybody to run various kinds of analysis, identify gaps, and then generate lots of data. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sameen. Uh, we would like to have blessings of our past directors. Uh, in that uh, stead, I would ask uh, Dr. S.K. Sharma, sir, to please uh, bless us. If not, sir is not able to unmute himself. Just please let me, let me know. We'll see. Yes, I think sir is trying to unmute. I, I'll, I'll do that one. Uh, Professor Sharma, please uh, unmute yourself, sir. Now you are, you are able to unmute now. Yeah. Please. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to speak few words uh, on the very auspicious occasion of the Bureau today. Uh, Dr. T.R. Sharma, the chief guest of the function, uh, Dr. D.K. Yadav, the guest of honor, Professor Paul Gaps, uh, Dr. P.L. Gautam, Dr. Arasana, Dr. Kuldeep Singh, the distinguished participants, guests, scientists, and the staff of the Bureau. I'll take this opportunity to congratulate the director and the NBPHR team on this 20, uh, 45th Foundation Day of the uh, Bureau. Uh, <clears throat> the lecture by Professor Paul Gaps was very inspiring. It was very educating. And indeed, this is an area uh, which is of concerns to all the gene banks globally and is also being asked by the funding organizations regarding the utilization of the uh, extent of utilization of the uh, genetic resources which are conserved in the gene bank. After leaving the Bureau for, uh, during 2010, I, I was in touch with the Bureau. I remained in touch with the Bureau in different capacities and uh, happy to uh, see the progress uh, that the Bureau has made uh, in the area of the PGR management, uh, the conservation, uh, exploration, evaluation, genomic resource development, database development, and so on. And this has been reflected in the form of scientific quality of the annual reports, uh, the other books, reports, documents, development of databases, and more important, the quality of uh, uh, peer-reviewed publications with very high impact journal, uh, which I also mentioned uh, in one of the meetings of the RAC. And more importantly, the awards and the honors which have been bestowed upon the scientists of the uh, Bureau. And uh, I congratulate you all, the awardees on this occasion. The Bureau is recognized nationally and internationally in the area of PGR management. And I hope in years to come, the Bureau would be a leader, a torch bearer 
to other nations in the area of uh, plant genetic resource management. And with a few words, I uh, wish the Bureau, the staff and the scientists a great success in years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I'd like to request Dr. Dillon, although I don't yeah. see him. Uh, Manjisha, Dr. Dillon has a weak uh, connectivity, so he has sent his congratulatory note. He won't be able to speak. So he has a poor connectivity at the moment. So you may. Uh, Dr. Gautam, sir, please. Let me see if he's. Uh... So was there. We have to unmute him. Uh, I can't see with uh, what Dr. name. Dr. Rana? Dr. Rana, sir. Thank you. Well, I congratulate the Bureau as I see the progress report presented by the it is really commendable. I had been associated with the persons who conceive the conservation of germplasm in India and then established the Bureau as the lead center. What was really conceptualized was conservation under natural conditions with evolutionary process intact. Long-term storage or the gene bank was only thought to be as a dupli duplicate safety. We always emphasize networking, regional stations, active germplasm site and we had started at that time about 60 sites. Idea was that they should be grown in uh, climatic conditions from where they were collected and evolutionary processes are continuing there. We invite breeders to these sites and they pick up what the field is useful to them. We also envisage crop advisory committees to have better coordination between the Bureau and the breeder. In that context, I would just suggest possibly apart from the progress that has been presented, which I highly appreciate, we should also keep in mind that kind of network, which really was the basis of our effort that we had Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, with that, I think uh, we would ask to ask uh, Dr. D.K. Yadav, ADG Seeds, to kindly ad address us. We'd be honored, sir, to hear you. Thank you, madam. Good morning to all. And I personally welcome for this 45th Foundation Day celebration of this National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources. Honorable Dr. T. R. Sharma, the chief guest for today's function, and our distinguished speaker of today's Dr. Husband Harvajan Singh lecture, Dr. Paul, the distinguished professor from UC Davis, former directors of the Bureau. Honorable Professor T.L. Gautam, Dr. R.S. Rana, Dr. B.S. Dillo, Dr. S.K. Sharma, the present director, Dr. Kuldeep Singh, the directors of the other institute, I can see Dr. K. Singh is there, Dr. Uti Adho from Kajri, Dr. Rajendra Prasad from ISRI, Dr. Shashni from NIPB, Dr. Suresh Pal from NIAP, Dr. Suhas Chandra and CIPM, and Dr. Anachalam from Kapri and Dr. Uma from Banana Institute, and also our former colleagues from Bureau, 
Dr. Moria and Dr. Sarsena. The, all the scientists from the various ICR institutes and SAUs, and uh, also Dr. J.C. Rana and Dr. Vasne from the CG centers, and all the staff of the National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources. So first of all, my heartiest congratulations and my best wishes to the director and all of his staff of the Bureau on this very auspicious occasion. As we are all are well aware that the rich genetic diversity is the key to the success of any genetic enhancement program, may it be in case of crops, animals, fish, and so on. ICR has always given highest priority for the management of biodiversity, which includes the crop varieties, livestock, fish breeds, and agriculturally useful insects and microbial species. And NBPGR has also played a very significant role in the country in the collection, conservation, characterization, and exchange of plant genetic resources to both public and private sector stakeholders. And the director has very elaborately presented about all these activities in his, during his presentation. So as a result of these concerted efforts, the Bureau, our National Gene Bank at the Bureau today is the second largest gene bank globally. And we have now conserved more than 4.5 lakh jumplage vaccines. And we are playing a very important role in the management and utilization of genetic resources, not only within country, but also we are providing the leadership internationally and have the collaborations with FAO and United States and other CG institutions. We held for past few years about the uh, safety duplicates and with our the very specific interest of our vulnerable DGSAB and DDGSAB, we have started to find out the for establishment the National Safety Copy Plant Gene Bank. And uh, for that already a national expert committee under the chairmanship of Honorable Dr. R.S. Paroda was made and all our former directors, including Dr. Gautam and all senior uh, they, peers, they were the part of that committee. And the committee has given one preliminary report. And based on that, we have already initiated some process and for that uh, a specific provision will be made in terms of funding also in the times to come once we are finalizing all these modalities for establishment of this NSCPBG. And in this direction, we, our Honorable DDG has already written a letter to the coordinator of the Solvard Global Seed Wall, Dr. Asmad Asdal, and uh, we have sought some information, basic information regarding the uh, this uh, safety duplicate gene bank and uh, he was very kind enough to give some specifications and also we have requested him to be on the expert panel to give the advice on the various issues of establishment of safety duplicate facility and uh, I am very happy to, to, share, to share that he has already agreed for be a member on our expert panel for this safety duplicate gene bank. Further to strengthen the various activities other than the normal routine institutional uh, that funding, we created a concern, uh, implemented a consortium research platform on agrobiodiversity during 12 five plan, five year plan, and now it is in the, it's the third phase during the next plan 2021-26, which is already the process, EFC is in process. And this uh, consortium that includes 60 institutes and state agriculture universities and covering a huge array of plant, animal, fish, and now we have included the microbes and insects also, which were deleted in the previous second phase. So that is also that program is a very, I think, dynamic and a huge program which is going on. Earlier, the funding was a little bit less during the last four years, 2017-2021. It was uh, around 12 crore rupees, but now we have announced this funding for the next phase that is up to 31 uh, crores. And uh, I hope that is one program which is, uh, I think, giving a good visibility, particularly in terms of the characterization, evaluation, and regeneration of the various genetic resources. And during past phase 26,000 just large accessions, they were characterized, evaluated, and regenerated. And now, in case of maize, uh, around more than 11,000 accessions, they are already under process of evaluation at the regional uh, IIMR's regional station at Deku Sarai. So that is one of the very important aspects. 
being the now we are the asia's largest gene bank and it, it was established at that that uh, rana has mentioned that established during 1997 uh, almost 20 years back so it required a huge renovation total renovation and during 1819 we could provide uh, funding of around 20 crores and now the our uh, this national gene bank is the state of art gene bank competing with many of the best of the best global facilities particularly in terms of the gene bank so that has already in, in operation the another aspect which has been given to bureau although this nrc dna fingerprinting was already there but the council has uh, given the responsibility for the dna fingerprinting of all the genetic resources including the released variety so they are also helping in that aspect to the pgr that genomic unit and now we have submitted a proposal after having a long deliberation through the all uh, the national system nars uh, and that proposal is already for the field, 30 field probes for their uh, varietal identity and that will be used for the genetic purity also during the various certification programs. So that is already with TAC and we hope that in the times to come it will be coming. Digitalization is one of the very important aspect I think in the today's era and already Dr. Archak has done a very good job and I think most of the data that is now digitalized and that is online and today's uh, the new portal that has also been shown. But uh, still, I think we need to have some more work on that direction. The barcoding of all the PGR in the gene bank that has been, uh, has been discussed for a long time, and I think some work has been initiated. So I think the barcoding in terms of the whole passport data and all the specific traits for which the germplasm is there, so that needs to be done on priority. And now where everybody is talking about the precision, precision for all the aspects. So when we talk of the precision breeding that I have been discussing with Dr. Kuldeep many times, that when we give a set of germplasm to any of the indenters, so we should have the uh, gene, uh, that genomic sequences for the various markers which have to be used so that the breeder, once he is taking that material along, along with the genomic information, he or she, they can go for validation and then can, they can use that particular material for interrogation of the specific trait for that, that germplasm has been or from or uh, that uh, taken from the NDPGR. So that type of, I think, culture will have to inculcate in the NDPGR with the help of the various community institutions because the uh, Bureau alone cannot do all those things. There is no doubt that the excellent achievements have been made and the, we have a very successful past and historical achievements are there, but still some, on some of these aspects we need to work. The new lead which Dr. Kuldeep Singh's intervention has taken that we have now a MOA with the National Medicinal Plant Board and uh, already the MOA has been signed along with the, the National Botanical Survey of India also because that component was earlier lacking. And uh, I think with this, uh, that uh, particular um, uh, for the medicinal plants also, they will now be, the set will be conserved with the NPGR. So with this background, and uh, the today's celebration of Foundation Day by the ICR and VPGR is very much in the line of the programs and the priorities of the government of India in general and with the, of the uh, ICR in particular, <coughs> fulfilling all the global obligations following the various regulations internationally and nationally. We, I, have, I specifically have the... Uh, specifically, I thank to the Professor Paul for his very, I think, uh, comprehensive lecture, particularly on the challenges to the utilization of gene banks. And from starting from the very beginning to the present day technologies, he has elaborated very nicely and given the challenges and their solutions also. So thank you very much, sir, for accepting our request, our request and being with us. My sincere thanks to our DDG Crop Science, Dr. Priya Sharmaji, for uh, that uh, on this uh, accepting our request for this gracious his gracious presence and agreeing to be the chief guest and i am also very grateful to our honorable former directors and the other distinguished guests and scientists for attending this program i once again compliment the director and the whole staff of the bureau for organizing this program having a very beautiful work which they have done and look forward for more vibrant programs in the future also and wish them all the best for their enhanced role in crop improvement program across the country through their trade specific evaluation program. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for guiding us.
and uh, I'd like to now request Dr. R.C. Agrawal, sir, uh, DDG Education, to please uh, bless us. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Manjusha. And thanks to uh, Honorable uh, all previous uh, directors, uh, Honorable uh, DDG Crop Science, and uh, the present director, Dr. Kuldeep Singh, uh, my good wishes uh, to this great institute, which in a very short time has grown uh, like anything and has made its impact not only at the national level, but at the global level. Uh, because I have been closely associated, so I have a special affection for this uh, institute. And uh, whatever uh, we could uh, achieve in life, uh, that credit goes to NVPJR because uh, my all directors with whom I worked, especially I can see today Dr. Rana, uh, Dr. Gautam, uh, I can see Dr. Bansal, and many uh, Dr. Sarma, uh, Dr. Dhillan, everybody was so supportive, everybody was so uh, visionary that whatever we are today, it was just uh, because of their visions, because of their hard work, which they just put. And it's really a pleasure that uh, we are uh, witnessing the progress today. We could see uh, from the report of uh, Dr. Kuldeep Singh, the lot of uh, awards which have uh, come to the scientists and a uh, lot of uh, progress in a very, very short time. I, we could see from uh, Dr. Dr. Sunil Achak's presentation, uh, I want to just congratulate uh, for, uh, uh, for launching such important uh, uh, software, uh, the PLIM. So really it's a matter of great uh, satisfaction, matter of great pride for all of us. And I want to congratulate uh, DDG Crop Science uh, that uh, his uh, institute is growing like anything. And uh, it makes us all uh, proud. Uh, uh, and we are really uh, so satisfied with the progress of this uh, institute. So once again, I compliment each one of you and I congratulate each one of you on this important day. Thank you all. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, like uh, Gautam Sab has joined. No, Gautam Sab has joined, if you want. Uh, Dr. Dhillo has also joined. So if uh, our chief guest would allow, I would uh, request... Yeah, please, please go ahead. Uh, uh, sir, uh, Dr. Dhillo, please. No, Dr. Dr. Gautam is available quickly. I will try to see if uh, Dr. Dillo is unmuted or not. Okay, Dr. Gautam, please then. So please uh, bless us then. Dr. Sharma, uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Dr. D.R. Sharma, the DDG Crop Science and uh, Chief Guest of today's function, the speaker of the day, who has given very interesting uh, insight of uh, germplasm enhancement, management, and characterization. My all pre previous uh, directors of uh, NBPGR, the president director, Dr. Kuldeep Singh, and all our uh, members of uh, NBPGR family and other ICR institutions, the nodal point in ICR uh, of the Institute, Dr. Yadav. It is a matter of great uh, pleasure for me to speak to you on the 45th uh, Foundation Day of the Institute. I feel so happy that uh, the tradition of celebrations of the Foundation Day which we formally started in 1997 is uh, being continued with great interest. And uh, the very, you know, the, the very fact that uh, you are having the Harbhajan Singh Memorial Lecture by eminent speakers on this day added a lot of value to the celebrations. As Dr. Agrawal said that uh, this institute has done tremendous work 
and uh, we have grown and much of our growth uh, we attribute to NBPGR. Well, we have several memories and uh, reminiscences. Uh, the time is short. Uh, I would not like to tell on that, but it was uh, my brief stint of about three years in NBPGR, which to me appears to be a very productive time. And all of you were so helpful in executing the programs of uh, the NBPGR because it was transforming uh, from old gene bank uh, building to the new gene bank building and uh, taking many initiatives, linking with institutes in India and abroad. Uh, it was a great task. I enjoyed it and uh, I really would like to congratulate all the people, the uh, persons associated with uh, NBPGR. There are uh, many people who have retired and uh, they have contributed a lot. Everybody looks towards the NBPGR for good practices. And that is what is being maintained and compliments to all for this purpose. I would not like to comment on the, the speeches which were made uh, because some part of it I could not uh, witness. But uh, as the comments go, uh, the, they deserve congratulations for excellent presentations. So best wishes to you all. And uh, I join you in this uh, very gala celebration of the 45th Foundation Day. My best wishes to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, we would uh, just see whether... Yeah, yeah. Dr. Dillon is available, please. Yes, sir. sir Dr. Dillon, please. <clears throat> No, I think there's some, some <laughs> connectivity problem with Adrilo. He has sent a message again. I think uh, we can continue further. I think uh, Sir has written uh, congrat congratulations to the NBPGR family on the occasion of 45th Foundation Day and best wishes for the future. Pray that NBPGR continues serving the nation and humanity. With that uh, very apt message, I think uh, I would like to uh, request the Honorable Chief Guest, Dr. T.R. Sharma, DDG Crop Sciences ICR, to kindly address this August gathering. Thank you very much. Good morning to all. Our distinguished Director of the Institute, Dr. Kuldeep Singh, my colleague from the Council, Dr. R.C. Agrawal, DDG Education, former directors of the Institute, those who have joined today, Honorable Dr. P.L. Gautam, Dr. B.S. Dillo, Dr. S.K. Sharma, and Dr. R.S. Rana. Speaker of the day, Dr. Paul Gept, Distinguished Professor from UC Davis. My colleague from Council, Dr. D.K. Yadav. Distinguished Directors of uh, different ICAR institutes, NVPGR family, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to congratulate you all on this very auspicious occasion that is 45th foundation day of the institute it becomes more important when we have organized harvajan singh memorial lecture by none other than professor paul kept who has given very important insight of genetic resources, how we should conserve, characterize, and utilize in plant breeding. I would like to mention here that 
NBPGR is a flagship institute of the council and we always look forward to see that this institute should grow greater heights and try to help them from the council side we all know that plant genetic resources or nbpgr has five different verticals that is collection conservation characterization exchange and utilization of germplasm these five verticals are very very important and interlinked with each other if one of the vertical is weak then probably it is going to affect whole process of developing plant varieties this particular lecture which was delivered by professor paul is also very important because we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of indian independence to commemorate the monumental occasion by all the departments and ministry under the government of india and we all are hosting various activities to celebrate azadi ka amrit mahotsav in that context icar is organizing a series of 75 lecture under the leadership of my colleague dr rc agrawal and many of these lectures have been completed and delivered by very distinguished scientists across the globe so this 45th foundation day of nbpgr and the lecture by professor paul is another important activity of this particular azadi ka amrit mahotsav we all know that india is bestowed with the immense richness of agricultural biodiversity including diversity in crop plants wild plant diversity livestock diversity aquatic diversity and microbial diversity among the 12 mega centers for the plant species diversity of the world mega gene center in india has great importance northeastern himalayas and western ghats are the two out of the 31 global hotspots of the diversity biodiversity that are present in india the different gene centers in india possesses about 11.9% of world flora with 5725 species representing 141 genera and over 47 families of higher plants let me mention here that a uh, crop science division of indian council of agriculture research works on more than 85 crops or field crops and trying to improve different varieties of these field crops for which role of plant genetic resources is very very important we all know that plant genetic resources are one of the essential components that holds the key to the very foundation of agriculture as well as food and nutritional security for the world during the last four decades rapid progress in the field of agriculture was witnessed along with the collection conservation and sustainable utilization of plant genetic resources the presentation made by dr kuldeep singh about the progress of the institute during past one year 
is really commendable and if at this point in time i would also like to mention that the utilization of plant genetic resources is very dear to my heart because i started utilizing plant genetic resources in interspecific hybridization from 1988 onwards first in brassica and then in rice and i think we have extensively used these wild species local land races and different varieties of brassica and rice germplasm for identification of genes and their characterization mining alleles from different land races and orthologs from different wild species of rice therefore i always see a great hope and always look for the conservation of these resources genetic resources which are great reservoir of genes for different traits as we know the current status of national seed gene, gene bank is 4.5 lakhs accessions belonging to more than 2000 species of agriculture as well as horticultural crops and their wild and vd relatives in addition more than 1900 accessions are conserved in vitro and more than 11000 accessions have been cryo preserved that's the great strength of nvpcr on which all our biologists and breeders they are dependent if anybody is working on any biological problem in the country i think their first source of material is nvpcr therefore exchange of resources genetic resources is very very important activity of the institute which is driving the biological research along with agriculture research in the country uh, we know that nbpgr need to strengthen the plant genetic resource network of the country and there is a need to revisit and strengthen the national active germplasm sites with their greater active role in the management and utilization of plant genetic resources dr yadav has already mentioned that we have a crp on agrobiodiversity with more than 60 centers across the country and that crp consortium research project on agrobiodiversity is becoming very very important and significant and contributing a lot towards the conservation and utilization as well as characterization of genetic resources however in present context international negotiations and the rapid advancement in the fields of molecular biology biotechnology and bioinformatics have led to the emergence of new legal political and technical regimes that dictate plant genetic resource management the current barriers to free flow of plant genetic resources increasing kaun sare hai dikha rahe hain kaun se le ja raha hai ha kindly unmute kindly mute yourself please Sir, Dr. Sharma, you are muted. Can you unmute, please? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the current barriers to flow, free flow of PGR, increasing intellectual property right issues, and the vast potential of biological wealth yet to be tapped through bio prospecting and genetic engineering, and it has placed greater demand. on nations to adjust to the global changing scenario and our speaker 
uh, Professor Paul has given an excellent example of uh, how IPR issues can be tackled and we can do fingerprinting of our germplas. And we have, we, I am happy to note that we have a very active DNA fingerprinting group at working at NVPCR for which is characterizing uh, with all varieties of different crops and germplas using different types of DNA markers. We know that during the past couple of years, the Bureau has made great progress in this, in the direction of uh, plant genetic resource conservation, utilization, and characterization through a paradigm shift in its evaluation strategy of germplasm, which is being followed by National Gene Bank in various crops. Uh, and these crops like minor legumes, minor oil seeds, chickpeas, rice, and wheat are being undertaken through a funding from the Department of Biotechnology Government of India. And I would like to congratulate Dr. Kuldeep Singh, the director of the Institute and his team of scientists for attracting more than 350 crore rupees through competitive grants to complete this great task of genotyping and phenotyping of germplasm resources of different crop species, which just now I mentioned. We know that the current emphasis of crop improvement programs is to develop cultivars having genes for resistance or tolerance to abiotic stresses such as cold or drought and biotic stresses like diseases and insects. Besides that, quality of produce, water input, use efficiency, and stability of the performance. There is also a growing requirement for a wider variety of agri-horticultural products with diversity in taste, color, and nutrition, etc., which are of high value in the market. There is a need to modify the descriptors for evaluations accordingly. I would like to stress upon here that we have to characterize our genetic resources, particularly uh, major uh, food security crops like wheat, rice, and maize for their nutritional status. If I take one example of rice, most of the micronutrients are only present in either in the seed coat or aleron layer. So can we find some genetic resources in which endosperm is enriched with micronutrients like iron and zinc, as well as protein, so that the eatable products which we are getting from rice should be made available to the end user. This is one of the examples I am sharing here, but likewise in wheat, even in millets, and also in maize, most of these micronutrients are only uh, are available in, in their seed coat or in the uh, pericarp or aleurone layer. So one has to identify the, the, the uh, plant genetic resources across the crops for these quality traits, which are becoming very, very important to uh, overcome malnutrition in the country. You know, for the characterization and trait specific evaluation of job plot, we have at NVPCR wild garden facility for crop wild relatives at IRA farm, central instrumentation laboratory has also been created. We have very good field gene bank and ISAPOR and many other facilities are being created at NBPCR so that they can contribute towards the development of different species. Uh, I'm really happy to note that the scientists have published a very good number of peer reviewed papers, but it should need to be now 
published in high impact journals so that we can show our strength and that can only be possible if you develop network across the institutions crop based institutions and then try to use all available approaches for uh, utilization of germplasm resources for the mapping characterization and cloning of genes as well as dissecting of qtl to identify different genes present in the qtl i am also happy to note that uh, various publications have been released along with a database on uh, uh, named as ezr claim by dr uh, sunil and this type of databases have to be enriched and make should be made more user friendly for the use of uh, the scientific community before i close i would like to quote what father of nation mahatma gandhi has said in 1930 to quote him respect earth and life in all its diversity recognize that all beings are independent interdependent and every form of life has value regardless of its worth to human unquote on this occasion of its of 45th foundation day of nbpcr uh, i would like to say that this is the day of introspection what we have done during the past year and what we can plan for the next year and we have the blessings of all our previous directors and mentors we can make use of their expertise in various activities and various programs of the institute and i am really uh, blessed to know their suggestions and get their suggestions at this particular occasion so that we can uh, diversify and make our programs more effective i would like to congratulate again director of the institute dr kuldeep singh for effectively steering all the activities and programs of the bureau i think uh, the utilization of germplasm uh, in particularly in a uh, uh, pre breeding program has been started by dr kuldeep singh because of his earlier experience at pau and i would like to mention here that pre breeding activity is one of the most important programs across the institutes which we started last year and for that nbpcr has to contribute a lot and for that i am always looking for the help of nbpcr i would like to extend my heartiest wishes and congratulations to all the officers and staff of nbpcr on this foundation day and i i wish that uh, such type of lectures which was organized today by dr kuldeep singh should also follow in future and we should learn try to learn from our international uh, experts on such occasions where almost all institutes are connected so thank you very much dr singh for giving me opportunity to be here this morning and to be part of this very important program of the institute namaskar jai hind thank you sir thank you so much for inspiring us uh, your work on mapping cloning and characterization of uh, peak is now uh, textbook material and uh, giving us points to ponder in our research in this short address uh we uh, are very hard pressed for time and we know that we have all our retired colleagues with us with whom we do, we would have loved to interact but uh, we are not able to uh, uh but in adversity we also find some opportunity so we can uh, rejoice that all our regional stations the 10 regional stations colleague are all with us today and we are having just one uh, foundation day celebration rather than having 11 that we normally do and uh, with this i'd like to request dr kavita gupta oic pme cell to propose a vote of thanks 
Thank you, Dr. Manjisha, respected DGG Crop Sciences, Dr. T. R. Sharma, the chief guest of uh, the program today, Professor Paul Getz, distinguished professor, uh, UC Davis, former directors of NBPGR, senior retired faculty, senior colleagues, and dear friends joining us today for celebrating the 45th Foundation Day. I have been assigned the very pleasant task of proposing the vote of thanks. First of all, I, we wish to express our gratitude to the Honorable Dr. T. R. Sharma, the DDG Crop Sciences, for chairing today's function. Thank you, sir, for your kind support, inspiring words, and for your keen interest in utilization of PGR. We are extremely thankful to Dr. Paul Getz, distinguished professor, University of California, who is a renowned scientist for his wonderful lecture on challenges to the utilization of gene banks. Sir, we are extremely fortunate to have the, got the opportunity to listen to you as well as to interact with you. We also thank Dr. R.C. Agarwal, DDG Education, for allowing us the use of ICR facilities as well as for his kind remarks. We also thank Dr. D.K. Yadavji for his kind and gracious presence this morning and also for his special remarks. I also want to thank our former directors, Dr. R.S. Rana, Dr. P.L. Gautam, Dr. B.S. Dillo, and Dr. S.K. Sharma, senior retired faculty, for accepting our invitation and for their blessings. Special thanks to our director, Dr. Kuldeep Singh, who has been involved right from the beginning and who has steered the organization of this entire program. I sincerely thank my colleagues, Dr. Sunil Archak, Dr. Rakesh Bhardwaj, Dr. Suni, Sushil Pandey, Dr. Ravi Pamathi, Mr. Vishek Srivastava, Mr. KK Sharma, Arun Sharma, Sadhana, members of the organizing committee for meticulously planning and organizing this event. A special thanks to Dr. Manjusha for smoothly moderating the program and to Sri Vijay Mandal for his logistic support. I also thank Mrs. Kanchan Kurana, especially for him helping with the invitations. A special thanks to my colleagues to, of, in PME cell, Shivangi, Vikas, and Sanjeev for their all out help and support. A big thank you to all the participants, senior colleagues from ICAR, vice chancellors of universities, um, directors of ICR institutes, participants from PPVFRA, CSIR institutes, MOEF, NBA, ICFRE, BSI, DRDO, and state biodiversity boards for their presence this morning. I also thank all the heads of divisions OICs of units and regional stations and the staff of NBPGR for their participation today. A very special thank you to all the students participating today. In the end, I wish to thank one and all who have contributed towards this webinar in one way or the other. Thank you. Over to you, Manjusha. <clears throat> Manjusha, you are muted. Can you unmute? I think we are all done now. We thank you all, all the participants again, and uh, we wish you.